Um, if there's only one, it's in the right ventricle. If there are two, there's one in the right ventricle and the right um, atrium. And if there are three, there's one right atrium, right ventricle, and then in the coronary sinus for the left ventricle. That's for congestive heart failure. So when you test, every time a patient comes in to a clinic, you test the same three tests every single time. You test these in the OR as well. Um, it's capture threshold, which is the minimum voltage required to make the heart squeeze. You test this for each lead. So if there's um, two leads, you, you do this twice. If there's three leads, you do this test three times for each one. This tells you that um, the threshold, you want it to be under one volt at 0.5 milliseconds, so we know how to program the output. If it's one volt, we program the output two volts. Just double it. Um, the higher the threshold, more battery will be depleted every time it's used. I, you also check sensing every time, um, pacemakers ability to sense intrinsic signal. The P waves you want around 2 millivolts, and R waves you want greater than 5 millivolts. Um, you don't need to memorize this, but it's in the textbooks. <laughs> and then lead impedance, you don't have to do much for this test, it's all automatic. And impedance is a different word for resistance, but pacemakers are constant voltage systems, alternating current, so you use the word resistance for that versus DC, direct current, use resistance. <clears throat> um, so I guess I'll go through the tech. Does everything I say make sense yes, so yeah, far? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. When you say that the P waves have to be at least two and the R waves have to be at least five, what happens if you have someone who just like intrinsically they have low voltage heart? Yep. Arc? Yep. Mm -hmm. We have accept. I have accepted lower than that many times. So you just adjust the sensitivity of the pacemaker. Okay. And what that means is for the pacemaker to send intrinsic signal but block out other EMI like myopotential or um, signals from outside of the body, mm -hmm. there has to be a certain sensitivity, it's just a wall that covers up baseline noise but still is able to see the P waves. So if the P waves are a little smaller, maybe one millivolt, you just lower the sensitivity a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be two and five, you just like it? You just like it to be, yeah. Some people have juicy big signals, you'd be surprised you have. And then some people just have smaller signals like you just said, yep. Okay. How yeah. do you know that, that you, you can lower the signal and not create any long-term problems? Um, sometimes if the signal is very, very small, um, you can only lower it to a certain sensitivity and if the P waves or R waves are lower than that, you should really think about repositioning the lead, finding okay. a new spot. Um, yeah. That makes sense, thank yeah, you. Sure, sometimes if a patient has, like their normal sinus rhythm has big signal but then they go into atrial fibrillation, that can be very, very fine. So sometimes you can undersense that too. So we kind of, there's different um, sensitivity adjustments we can make each time. Okay, yeah. thank you. Sure, any, any other questions or anything I said that didn't make sense yet? Okay, um, so pacemakers have different modes, so DDD is a mode of a pacemaker. The first letter, you can have DDD, you can have AAI, that's really only in Europe. And then there's VVI. Um, the first letter is chambers paste. So if it's D, it's dual, atrium and ventricle. Um, the second letter is chambers sensed, dual, atrium and ventricle. So it's, it can sense P waves and R waves. And then the second D is response to sensing. So um, D stands for dual as well, but it mean, it stands for inhibit and track. It's just um, the pacemaker works on a series of timers, so it'll sense a P wave. It'll have a little timer to give the own heart time to conduct on its own. If it doesn't conduct on its own, it'll pace. And another timer goes off to make sure that the base rate stays above, say, 60, whatever you program it, and that timer goes off. So DDD is a mode, um, you, it can, if the patient goes into AFib, it mode switches, that's what we call mode switching, to DDI, so the pacemaker won't track or time off of AFib. You don't want the pacemaker to time off, of, or do you know why the pacemaker shouldn't time off of AFib? <laughs> no B waves. Right, yep, you're not in normal sinus rhythm, there's no atrial quick, and then it's very, very rapid. So if you time off of AFib, it'll rapidly pace, make the patient feel really even worse. Um, and then as far as modes go, 
Um, there's such thing as rate response. So sometimes you see the R at the end, DDDR, VVIR. That's for patients who have chronotopic incompetence. Their heart doesn't speed up on its own when it, they're exercising. And so each company does it a different way. <laughs> but St. Jude uses um, a piezoelectric crystal and it, it's uh, rotation in the shoulders. So the pacemaker picks up rotation and then it will pace at faster rates after it's rotating a little bit. Other companies use your speed of breath but I'm kind of breathy, so I feel like that would get me. Or if you're having um, yeah. like a, a panic attack or something, yeah. it can be a false. And then, um, but say for St. Jude, it can be like rocking chairs. Or if you're walking upstairs, you think about it, you don't rock your shoulders as much as when you're walking downstairs, but you need the heart rate going up. So there's limitations to each one. Yeah. Hmm. So they're kind of given that, like, you can no longer go on a rocking chair, kind of something like that. No, they can go on rocking okay. chairs. That was just a silly example. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but don't take that away. That was just a silly example. <laughs> yeah, don't go on rocking chairs. Um, I'm trying to think of other companies. Minute ventilation. Yeah. So the R is just for patients. You don't turn that on in every patient. Um, just people who kind of feel crummy when they're exercising. So we can run through thresholds if you guys want, one by one, and then I can explain. So when you're running a threshold, remember that's your force pacing the heart and seeing the last voltage that captures the heart muscle. And the way we see that is from intracardiacs, the, the signals from within the heart. There's little electrodes at the tip of the leads. And then we can see the morphology, the way that the EKG looks. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, just changes when you capture it. So the native signal, um, this patient, see it's all pink, is this demo patient, is on their own at 70. Their pacemaker is set at 60, so 70, the pacemaker is kicking back and just watching. If, it, if there's a dip in the heart rate, if there's, the timer goes off, they'll pay, it'll force pace. So to run a threshold um, in the ventricle, <coughs> Um, I'm going to pace and look at the ventricular channel here. So you're saying if the normal heart rate goes below this threshold, then we're going to start pacing? Yep, just okay. a normal pacemaker function, everyday function, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just about to run a threshold so we can test the minimum voltage required uh, to depolarize or capture the heart muscle. And it's in ampules? It's in voltage, yeah. Okay. We used to measure it in amps, but now we measure it in volts. Okay. That was like 20 years ago, actually. Yeah. We wasn't even like in the <laughs> industry. Okay, so um, you can see the morphology changes as soon as I capture, see this versus this. And so I'm capturing and it's decrementing or decreasing the voltage as I go along. Um, it's really slow. So we're still capturing the morphologies. So see how it changed here? Yeah. So we lost capture here. Mm -hmm. So since we lost at one volt, you touch where you lost. So you're it, just kind of telling the machine, OK, this is when we don't want it to happen. Like this is kind of a. Yeah, you don't want this to happen. You don't want them to be pacing in real life. So we, we do these threshold tests so we know how to program the outputs, the constant outputs in real life. OK. Yeah, because. the minimum amount of jolt that it has to give in order to pace the heart. Okay. Correct. Yep, so we lost, so that it, the intrinsic signal came in here, and we lost here, so the threshold is 1.25 volts at 0 0.5 milliseconds. It's a voltage applied for a certain time. It's the, I'm sorry, it's the one that's the last heat caught before it was paused, yep. right? So yep. it's usually not that specific line, but it's the one to the left? Correct, yep, since we lost here, the threshold is yeah. the one before, yep. And, um, Electrolyte imbalances can affect thresholds. That was a question. Um, hyperkalemia is a really common one that will increase a threshold in a pacemaker. So sometimes I've seen the thresholds go up and down in a patient and you look in their chart and they do have electrolyte imbalances. So 1.25 volts, that's really, really low voltage. What is like the minimum that you can have capture with? According to the pacemaker, it's 0 0.25 volt. That's oh, as low as before. The, uh, below that, wow. you're gonna have the pacemaker's gonna last a long, long time. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Some um, thresholds. So if the threshold continually rises, or okay, say the patient got a pacemaker, and the next day the threshold is double what it used to be, but the sensing is still okay. But then the day after that, the threshold is 
four volts. It keeps you, jumping. It keeps jumping. It keeps changing. You would probably take the patient back in and readjust because that that can mean that there's a micro lead dislodgement. Just a, even a small dislodgement can, you know, change your pacing threshold, affect your battery. Mm -hmm. um, how would you know that if they're already? How would you know that that's happened? From testing it, or if, say, the patient has complete heart block, they feel great after getting their pacemaker, and then they start fainting Sorry. again. When we do a quick check, is that actually testing it? A quick well? check? Just if you, you put the like wand over? When they take mm -hmm. Yeah, the pacemaker. pacemaker quick check. What are we checking with that? If there are any alarms that went off in the last oh, period, okay. right? Mm -hmm. so not here. But it, and a lot of them have automatic thresholds. The newer pacemakers do all of it, most of it on its own. So you'll see that the daily threshold. Um, all of the company, they have a little A by them, so you'll see, okay, the P waves were four today, R waves are greater than 12 today, you know, threshold, and you check it from last time. All okay. of them have this. Most of them have this. So even though you set the threshold on that machine when you're putting it in, the pacemaker itself will self-adjust that every day? If you turn on a certain algorithm, it can. Oh. But the way I was talking about it, no. Um, usually you just you test the threshold. If it's one volt, I would program it personally at 2.5 volts and then call it good. Uh, if the patient uses it all the time or if they have maybe a chronically higher threshold, like 2.25 volts, I would turn on auto capture and that does a beat by beat um, threshold test every single time. Um, and it can help save the battery actually because it will self-adjust. It's, it's good for patients who have fluctuating thresholds or high thresholds. Yeah, because when you turn on that algorithm, you don't have to have a two to one safety margin. It can be just a half a volt or a 0.75 volt safety margin, just since it checks it every single beat. Yeah. How long does a battery generally last? St. Jude is the best battery. <laughs> you do. I know it's five to seven years on a pacemaker. Okay. That's what I say. But it really depends, depends on, on the energy. Yeah, it depends on how they're placed. It depends on how much they're using it. Mm -hmm. um, some our new pacemakers are warranted for ten years, um, and then some defibrillators, if they use, if they have a lot of VT and they require a lot of um, shocks, that can deplete the battery a little bit. I think one shock is the equivalent of three months depleted every oh, time. Yeah, so do you guys want to run some tests or yeah, I'll go over right. a Okay. Thank you. Sure. So who wants to go first? <laughs> you and me. Yeah. Do it. I mean, Can go. I go? Yeah. yeah, yes, please. Okay. Right. Let's do the ventricle first. It's the yeah. most fun. Yeah. Okay. So I click it? Yep. Touch right. it. And then we're going to go DDD. So we're going at 70. We're going to force pace. We're going to start yeah. at 1.75. Last one was 1.25. So that should be high enough. Let me just change a few things. It took forever last time. Okay, cool. So again, D means dual meaning we're doing the atrium and the ventricle. Mm -hmm. Do you mean you're sensing both atrium and ventricle? And then the last one I forgot. The, the last one, it's the trickiest. That's um, the response to what it senses. It's how the pacemaker responds to what it senses in the atrium. Oh, so if it's okay. if the patient's in normal sinus rhythm, you're gonna want to track off of that or time off of that mm -hmm. to keep AV synchrony. But if the patient goes into AFib, you're gonna want to inhibit and not look at the AFib. The AFib. And it would be DDI. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. So right now, or if you're pace, if you're tracking off normal sinus rhythm, it's DDT. We don't need to know that. It, it's just DDD. Okay. Okay. So. Yep. So hold the test. Yep. And then we're gonna look at this channel here because we're pacing the ventricle. So you, you're capturing because it's nice and wide, and then we just release when you lost or when it goes narrow again. Because that's when. Okay. Nice. Exactly. So then, let's see if I can even explain it. So uh, one, like, maybe a little bit over one volt, that's when it stopped sensing? Mm -mm. So it's still, it, that's when it stopped, it, it didn't have enough voltage to capture enough heart to capture the right ventricle. Okay. So slowly going in 0.25 increments, and yeah. then all of a sudden you get capture and then you stop. Yeah. So that's yeah. okay. At the minimum that the um, hmm. this is the minimum 1.25 volts was the minimum voltage that captured the heart muscle. Once we got to one volt, it goes back to its n normal sinus, normal QRS because it, rhythm. Because it paced. So it paced here. Oh, here before it reached its threshold. threshold. Exactly. Okay. Okay. 
And then if one is your minimum, you tend to set it higher than that? Mm, I, I like to do, well, at two least, to one, at least okay. two to one. Okay. Unless you have auto capture on, then it'll Then do it would just automatically change it for mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So then the atrium, we can do two. So we're going to paste DDD. So we're going to try to capture the atrium. She's, um, patient's going 70, so we're going to paste at 90 and then give a long timing to conduct to the ventricle. And then last time was one, so we'll go to two and a half. And, we'll and, hit, then, we'll hit and then we'll look up and here. And this time we're, okay. Mm -hmm. So you just okay. keep going lower and lower and lower until you find that lowest threshold. Yep, exactly. So that it will stop, right. yep. that it won't sense the heart anymore. So the atrium, there's less muscle in the atria, so it doesn't have the, the wide QRS that we're used to seeing. But you can, so this release. That's change, yeah. yeah. And that's the change right there. Yep, exactly. Yeah, you just look for a change, either in, um, sequence, morphology, or rhythm rate. Okay. So, so we paced here and it conducted down, paste, conducted down, paste, and then it didn't conduct down here. So we actually lost right here. And then this was the intrinsic P wave. Since it didn't capture the atria, the sinus node kicked in mm -hmm. and then it, we sensed it afterwards. So we lost there. Okay, right here. Yeah. Okay. And you just do it for both of those, and then if there was another lead, uh huh, then you would do another one. Yep. Oh, okay. Yep. And if we were to have one more lead, so we have one in the right atrium, one in the right ventricle yeah, now. Coronary. Yeah. If sinus. we had one more, it'd be in the left ventricle or coronary right. sinus. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. Got it. Thank you. Sure. Does anyone else want to do it? Yeah. Okay. I'm all in. Okay, so let's do the threshold. So right there. And then it's all set to go. So we're gonna force pace it by shortening. Right now the, the patient's going 70 by themselves and then the timing between the A and the V on their own is 230. So we're gonna pace it 100. So we're gonna force pace the ventricle. And we're gonna, we're gonna push the, your, the P to get our interval smaller? Okay. Yes, exactly. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we call it AV delay in the pacemaker, yeah. Okay. So you're going to hit hold and then push it kind of hard, and then we'll watch the morphology on this channel here. So go ahead now. Yep. So you're capturing here. And the morphology is wider because um, the native intrinsic rhythm is more efficient. No, it's narrow. Yep. So you got it. Yep, so you lost. So you can release. So what happens if you hold it down? Like the nothing, nothing. Um, we'll, we, it'll show you a review screens. You can kind of scroll back and, and look at your work or look at the test. But so you didn't like mess up the program. So no, you keep didn't. Pacing, but at a higher voltage, it'll keep decrementing even if you lost. So you're effectively not pacing it. So that yeah. only required one, one, the volt to be at one. So the, we lost. So did we capture or lose at one volt? Looks like we got it back at one, right? So um, we were pacing um, at 1.25 and then we captured here because it's nice and wide. Okay. We captured the right ventricle and then as we decremented down to one volt. Oh, it, was, it helped it down, okay. Yeah, um, the patient conducted on their own and we did not capture the heart muscle. Because so the threshold was lower than what we actually, like the, the basically there at one, but this, the actual Pacemakers at 1.25. Correct. It, well, the so we lost at one, so the threshold is at 1.25. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the threshold is the minimum amount mm -hmm. that okay. works. I see. Okay. So if they were at 1.5, then we would kick on at 1.25. Yep. Exactly. Okay. And if if the threshold increased to 1.5, you would want to increase the output maybe to three volts instead of oh. two and a half volts because you want more of a safety margin. Okay. Okay. We have the, does it know to change on its own or does that right? No, so, some of them, some more. of them are programmed that way and some of them are not. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Thank you. The so newer much. ones are. Oh, is there a max voltage that you want to use with a pacemaker for a shot? The highest I can program is seven and a half volts. Okay. Um, but if I do that, the battery will last like two years. Right. So like for short term, you can go up to like say 10 
if you really had to. If you really had to, yeah. Um, but it's usually not necessary. Yeah. And you want to go at the lowest that you can. What's the safety margin like? Do you have to have like you want a two? Five? You want a two to one safety margin usually, okay. unless that special algorithm's on that will do the beat by beat test. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Sure. Did you want to run the test? Um, Did you already run? Yeah, I'll do it. Okay. I've never cool. done it. Cool. So you. So we're gonna look here. So well, you're pacing yeah. now. Okay. Capturing. It's wide, wide, wide. 1.5 volts. Now we're at 1.25 volts. Now we're at one volt. Nice. Exactly. And then I'll show you that the atria is a bit uh, more tricky because you it doesn't look that different since there's less atrial muscle to capture. Um, but we're gonna pace at 70. So in, right now the patient's on their own at 70. So we're gonna pace at 90. I mean. Okay. So you're just gonna look for it to sp speeding up. Yeah, right so it's there. speeding up here, yep. And it's conducting down. Then if you release, I'll show you where we lost. Oh, so we already lost. Yeah, yeah I know it's kind of tricky. Okay, so A pace here. See how the QRS is uh, above the baseline and below the baseline, mm -hmm. A pace. And then here it just got kind of smaller and then we didn't conduct down okay. to the ventricle. Gotcha. Um, and then the, own, the intrinsic P wave came in on its own there. Okay. So then what would the threshold be here we if we were, lost at one? So the threshold would be one, wouldn't it? The threshold would be the last one that worked. Um, yeah. Take them through like the various um, problems, let's say LVB leader or sensing. Okay. Um, so by VB, just make up the scenario. Okay. The LVB is not pacing. Them figure it out instead of you telling me what it is. Okay. So, how do you in, just go to the BBD system, have it be the atrium and the ventricle over sense, under sense, make believe that there's a lean fracture in the LV or a lean fracture in the RV, and then have them reach that conclusion. Okay. If somebody's very far, it could be heart block, um, you know, not pacer dependent, or pacer dependent, make them, you know, fall into the trap of, you know, not pacing them hard at all. Okay. Okay, so yeah, yeah. different scenarios. So let's just join in. Let's really get the most out of this. Okay, it's, I just moved the thing. Sorry. Every day that you're going to have something like that. Wait. Okay. So it was 1.25. Sorry. Yes. Right. Yes, okay. exactly. Okay, so let me pull up um, a more complicated system. Okay, so remember how I said pacemakers need to sense appropriately so they know how to respond. If um, a patient, I mean, if a pacemaker or defibrillator under senses, it's not sending the intrinsic signal. It thinks nothing is there. So then will it, will it pace or will it not pace? It'll, it'll pace. pace. And it'll, in fact, it'll overpace because there is, there is signal there, but the pacemaker didn't, or defibrillator didn't see it, and it'll overpace. Mm -hmm. And the opposite is true. So if, the, if it oversenses maybe uh, muscle stimulation or it can oversense, um, if, if the lead dislodges, it can oversense, the ventricle lead can sense atrial signal and vice versa, um, it will, if it oversenses, it will underpace, mm -hmm. which is the worst if a patient's pacemaker dependent mm -hmm. or if they have complete heart block. Mm -hmm. The pacemaker thinks, oh, their heart's going 70 beats per minute on its own. In fact, there's nothing there. So I'll show you a demo um, of a bi ICD. That's with the three leads. We talked about this a little bit, like when there's an artifact and the pacemaker thinks that it's actually like say you're moving around yeah. and the pacemaker thinks that there's actually a rhythm Yep. Um, and it'll stop. Does that happen? That's, so that would be, would that be over sensing over or sensing. under sensing? That would be over sensing. Yep, exactly. So that was just one of the scenarios that I just talked about. So it'll be, it would over sense artifact okay. and think that there's signal there and then kick its hands back and think, oh, the patient's okay. going 70 on its own. Yeah. What yeah. Other things like a cause of their sensing. If a lead dislodges, like right after implant, it can um, be flipping around in the ventricle and sense mm -hmm. the heart beating at different time, you know. Um, or if it if it dislodges and it pulls back to the tricuspid valve, it can sense A and V signal, and that's particularly bad if you're over sensing. You'll be under pacing, but it's particularly bad with defibrillators. Because defibrillators, 
they think it's VT, VT or VF. Yeah. yeah. So those patients get shocks and shocks and shocks because it thinks it's not terminating it, but it's really just oversensing. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not calm. It's not that common. No, it's um, um, so oftentimes after you get a, I mean every time after you get a new pacemaker or defibrillator. You, you tell the patient not to lift their arm above their head for a couple weeks, I say a month, and they give them a sling just to remind them. Um, I had a patient fall out of her car and dislodged all of her leads. Um, I had another patient who had Twiddler syndrome. That was another question. Um, so Twiddler syndrome is um, where the patient, um, they don't really know that they're doing it, but they flip the pacemaker under their skin on their own. On their own? Yeah. And, no, they just so is the pacemaker. Yeah, yeah, they don't know that they're doing it, yeah. and um, oh. up, like, and they'll twiddle it. Twiddle? Yeah, Twiddler syndrome literally means twiddling. Yeah, okay. it does. So the pacemaker is sutured down um, on the clear epoxy part, I'll show, um, at one place, so you get, it can be rotated around that that um, suture over and over, and it'll the the leads will look like they're braided. As when you do it, when you fix it, cool. they just they, they totally retract the leads out themselves. You, mm -hmm. Most common with pacemakers, but it I have seen it with a defibrillator with the three leads. It was horrible. Okay, <laughs> so can you show us examples like what would so Dr. Benzer wants us to see like lead displacement, lead from all the different like the RV, LV, RA lead fractures atrial perforations and pulse generation, generator depletion. Thank you. Kind of like the examples okay. and sort of test us on what we're seeing, if that makes sense. Yeah. The demo doesn't have these. <laughs> but, um, okay, so I will, I'll make a programming change and you have to figure out right. what needs to be done. See, this demo's not going to work. I know. I'll do it. That's the actual name of it, IBC? Like the, the view? Thank you for your time, Bob. This is great. Thank you. Sure. No, this is fun for me. I love this stuff. I'm happy to be here. Um, it's just nice to have a uh, like kind of like lame for us. Like, oh. Okay. This is how I speak normally, so this is my turn. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's, since it's a demo, it didn't change the morphology like it would in a real patient, but um, and it's so that, kind so of based. Is that the pacing rhythm or the actual rhythm? It is both, both. and I'll tell you why. Okay. Because the um, the see how it's pink at the top? It's A-sense and it's bi-V pacing. Mm -hmm. So the pacemaker or bi-V pacemaker portion is tracking off of the sinus rhythm. So sinus rhythm is 70 and then the, the we're force pacing it in the RV and LV. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So does anyone want to play around and see? Sure. Um, what am I doing? What, see what we should change to make it better. Red. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so the threshold, what was the threshold in the LV last time? It looks like today it's 0.5, last time it was 1.3 at 0.5. Yeah. And then what are the outputs set at? So they're over here, yeah. 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2.5. So you would want the output in the LV to 3. be. 3.5. You would want it to be. 0.75? 0 0.25? Sure. So our, our threshold is 1.375, and we usually want to double the output. Oh, okay. So we just double, so like 2.6? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So the output of 0 0.5, would that be adequate? to capture the left ventricle? No, because you want 2.7, you said. Yeah. And in a real patient, the QRS, I mean, it wouldn't look like a beautiful captured beat. It would look like an intrinsic beat because it wouldn't be capturing. So it's a demo. basically we're saying that we have it set right now at 0.5, and that's not enough because when we had an issue today, it actually required 1.37. So you double it because you want to kind of like cover your basis. Yeah. And you, then. For sorry, safety. For safety. Okay, and so that would be like, you would get that notification on your little piece of paper saying, hey, there was sort of like a, whoops, 
Oh. You oh. unplugged everything. Did I just? I think you just turned off the. Around. Yeah, turned back on. There you go. For some reason this is yeah, charging. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, Daniel just messed everything up. So if that happens, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if you're running a test, everything will go back to the normal program setting. You don't have to worry about like, did I lose capture? And then it's going to be at 0.5 and nothing's capturing. Yeah. If that happens, you. Okay. Or if the wand falls off, you know, it goes back to the way it was programmed. And then why do you have to double it? Why? Because aren't you kind of wasting some battery power by doing that? Mm -hmm. you just because it's like a safety, it's just smart to do it that way because you might end up being two point something one time. Yeah, it might okay. be, yeah. If they get a little sleep or, you know, the thresholds can yeah. fluctuate a little bit because the body's a cha ever changing system or if they have hyperkalemia. So what um, would that be called? What is that example of? That's the, like a lead display pulse. Please. So that would be um, that would be capture failure. Capture failure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that you just programmed around, so you caught it with the 0.5. Okay. You would increase it. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Next. Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna do one more. I oh, will look away again. Yeah. <laughs> Not that we would even really. I know. Understand. Yeah, it's actually, it's actually true. Okay. So pulse generator depletion. Um, so when the, the battery, so after five to seven years, or with St. Jude, 10 years, on the, <laughs> on the battery, um, we measure the, so now there's a, a beautiful, okay, there's six months till the battery needs to be changed, there's three months to the battery, but in the, um, when they first developed pacemakers, they could tell battery longevity by placing a magnet over the pacemaker and it would force pace them at a certain rate, and that's how they could tell, oh, their heart rate's 86, the pacemaker's pacing at 86, oh, we should change the battery. 86 is the magic number. What, did, what exactly did the magnet do? Like, it would stop it from sensing? Yeah, yeah correct. It would pace with its eyes closed at a certain rate. Gotcha. Yeah, which is called D-O-O. -O. Mm -hmm. So O is not, it didn't, doesn't sense. The first D is it paces in both, mm -hmm. and then it doesn't sense, and it doesn't respond to anything it senses. So it's it doesn't not working. Sense. Yeah, but it just forced pacing for during that time. Okay. So if you place a magnet over a pacemaker, it'll pace DOO with its eyes closed. If you place it, do you know what happens if you place a magnet over a defibrillator? Shocks. Opposite. Oh, it's it will out. inhibit. It will inhibit tachytherapy. So if the patient's getting, you know, say jaw surgery or hand surgery, they'll they'll tape a magnet over the defibrillator so that defibrillator doesn't sense um, cautery or EMI and d from surgery signals and think that the patient's in VF and falsely shock them. What about like walking at the airport? Does anything there can, can it so, trigger anything? Or? So anything with a strong magnet may affect the pacemaker. Um, so if a patient goes through a metal detector, it may go off. I tell, I, I'm trained to tell patients that. I've never heard of it going off. It's so yeah. small. Um, but what may happen if it's a pacemaker, it'll pace with its eyes closed when you walk through. Um, or if it's a defibrillator, it'll disable tachytherapy just when you're walking through. Okay. So for that reason, if the patient's traveling, you tell them to, everyone at TSA knows, they just do a pat down instead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Does it ever happen that like when it blindly paces like that, because like when we test and we go to, we send the shock right on the T-wave, does yeah. it ever send them into VF because it just happens to blindly pace? That right is a risk. That could be a risk, but um, when it starts p pacing with its eyes closed, it does time off the last one. Oh. Okay. So, so it, un really unlikely. Okay. But that is a risk with DOO. What about if a patient has like a two hour MRI, would it just be non-functional for two hours? That is a great question. And MRI, um, okay, so if um, historically pacemakers were contraindicated with MRIs because anything with a strong magnet may affect the pacemaker. In fact, the thing they were most worried about with the MRI was circuitry damage and lead heating. The leads go right into the heart, so if the tip heats up, it'll cause an MI and the patient can be damaged. But little research was done when the first pacemakers came out. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, then recently, new leads have been designed by Medtronic first that had a little heat sink in them. So at the tip of the lead, before, like a centimeter back, I don't know how far back, there was a little piece of metal that was added that, sh that should heat up and then it shouldn't heat up at the tip. So it would protect the heart. But then as they, as they tested these new leads, they realized retrospective, like all the old leads also were fine. So, oh my God. so now we're you know we're doing all this this back data and um, MRIs. 
if they're under 1.5 Teslas, I think, and they're non-thoracic, they are fine with pacemakers now. I feel like I shouldn't be recording. But this is all, this is all very new. So, um, and then if they're in the MRI, the, yeah, the main thing that you're worried about is heat, the tip heating, and then the cir but the circuitry doesn't get damaged either because the, sh the shielding is so good now too with the titanium. So, okay. Lead placement, lead displacement or fracture. Okay, so over time, the leads have have demos. I'll show you. They have um, insulation around them, like silicone and polyurethane, that will um, shield the conductor, the metal conductor inside. The little coil is what sends the electrical impulse. Over time, two things can happen to the leads. Hopefully nothing ever happens, but um, the heart's beating rapidly. It's a really chaotic system in there, and sometimes the leads can rub against each other or rub against the can. So one thing that can happen is an insulation problem, insulation breach, where when they're rubbing against each other, the silicone polyurethane will have a hole in it. So that's why we check impedance every single time. Impedance will be the first indicator. If there's a hole in it and the electricity kind of seeps out into the blood pool, do you know if the impedance will rise or decrease? Decrease. Yes, the impedance will drop. Yep. Um, and then the opposite is true if the, if the, if the lead becomes kind of kinked or the, the conductor fractures um, or there's just a total break in the lead, the impedance will rise to greater than 3,000 because the circuit cannot complete because there's a big gap in the circuitry. Yeah. Okay. Another thing is when um, pacemakers are first implanted, they have to be, um, the lead is placed and then you, you put the lead inside the can, the clear epoxy part of the pacemaker can. If the, it's not all the way in the back of the can, um, if there's a little air gap there, the impedance will be greater than 3,000 and it won't pace either. You have to make sure it's bottomed out all the way. Yeah. So, if there's an insulation problem with the pacemaker lead, will the impedance rise or drop? Insulation will drop. Yes. Oh, sorry, impedance will drop. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And if there's a conductor, fra con conductor fracture, if there's a fracture in the lead, will the impedance rise or drop? Uh, Go up. Yeah. And it will also affect, obviously, the sensing and the capture because the circuitry is all messed up. So if there's insulation problem, it'll also be sensing blood pool and other activity. You'll see a lot of EMI. Um, if there's a conductor fracture, you may also see, I often see, um, if I um, push around the site, you'll see a bunch of EMI then. Yeah. And if there's an insulation problem, if there's a hole in the insulation, the threshold, it'll still be able to capture, but the threshold be, will be very, very high. Whereas if there's a conductor fracture, you can't even complete the loop, you won't be able to capture. Sometimes it'll be a conductor fracture every other beat because the heart's beating, so it, if it's broken and then it'll, it'll oh. yeah. Yeah, so that's tricky. Sometimes you have to run it over and over. Yeah, okay. Okay, so if there's, when a, a system is first put in, you can have perforation of the heart muscle. Mm -hmm. So that's where the lead pokes through. And um, if that happens, you can first see from the signal. So right now we have beautiful atrial signal and they're exactly, there's nothing in between them. You're not seeing anything else. But if um, there's perforate, you'll see beautiful signal like this. And if it perforates, the signal will get smaller and then you'll see extra stuff in between. And then the capture threshold will drastically rise because you're not, you're not really in your beautiful side anymore. You're kind of capturing maybe the pericardial sac or something. And then if you um, perforate, um, the pericardial sac can fill with blood and you can get a tamponade. And then the heart rate will increase, the blood pressure will drop. And so not, usually when you pull back, um, it, everything will resolve. But if it doesn't, then you have to do a synthesis. I don't have any part of any of this. You know, I just kind of step back, but this is what you can do. So the not touch the patient. You pull back it because you've essentially just plugged the hole that you created. Yeah. That, like, it, it'll. Cardiac tamponade. Sometimes it does. Yep, blood will leak through. Yeah. You would usually see an electrical alternate. Yep. Yes, I forgot to say that. Okay. Yes, because you've damaged and injured the tissue. Oh, mm -hmm. um, no, 
as it's a thought, hard as a balancing thing. That depends on what you're, you're looking at. Yeah. And, uh, it's too far away. But I don't know <laughs> if you would see it on this. You would see it on the surface. Just on exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Because it has to deal with the location of lead placement mm -hmm. because it's, it's perspective. Close you enough. Know, farther away. It's swinging back and forth, then it causes, you know, higher, lower, higher, lower. But on yeah. this, I don't think you're you so, see it, right? You're, you're so acute. Yeah. They have right. to see it on their machine. Right, the other ones in the yeah, so surface. somewhere in the room. It's yeah. not there. Right. John was saying something about like how, because if there's two electrodes or cathodes, whatever it is, uh -huh. again, um, and it pokes through, and then suddenly the electrical activity is like flipped compared to what it normally is, because usually it's going from this way to this way, but now it's going this way to this. Is that this? Mm. Is I, this I know what you're trying to say. Something about the defibrillator? Huh. So the cathode to anode, so you know, electricity flows negative to positive cathode to anode yeah. from a pacemaker. But electric it's all arbitrary really. I mean as long as it goes from one to the other, electricity I don't I don't actually know the answer then. He was like, well, he's like there's multiple there's two like there's don't you It'll guys have flip. the leads that have multiple yeah. electrodes? Or? Yeah. It, that's in the coronary sinus one. We have four electrodes. It must be something else I'm thinking of then. So, so I was emailed a question about um, why does pacing flow negative to positive, but defibrillation positive to negative or whatever? Is that what your question? Yeah. No, but you can go ahead and answer that. <laughs> that <was me. laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so I have all the answers. I'll email back, but I, I like was on my iPad earlier. But um, so. I don't think my answer is going to be satisfactory, but it's all arbitrary, really, with electricity. So negative to positive is just what they named it. And then um, when you're defibrillating, if, say this is the whole heart, um, you have your shocking coil and you have your SVC coil and then you have your can. And when it delivers a shock, it delivers it from the shocking coil to the SVC simultaneously from the shocking coil to the can. And then if that doesn't work, it'll flip and it'll try it from the SPC. It's just the way it'll deliver the energy. So it can be both ways. It's yeah. Whichever one works. And I mean, in the first case, um, from the defibrillator, the um, shocking coil to the SPC, the shocking coil is the anode, SPC is the cathode. And then if that shock doesn't work, you can, it'll reverse, pol you can reverse polarity and the SPC becomes the anode. It, anode and cathode is just di directionality of electricity. And with pacing, it's just a very short distance that Correct. electricity yep. is going through, right? Correct. But with, with uh, defib, it's going all the way up through the lead? Yeah, you want to capture the whole heart. And it's not going up through the lead, it's going ideally through the heart muscle. Right. You want to shock and stun the heart muscle so everything's in the same right. action potential phase. So okay. is that like where in the actual heart muscle is it inserted? So um, you have your SVC coil ideally in the SVC and then your defibrillation coil in the RV apex. Uh, it kind of has to do with lead placement and, and lead oh, spacing. That's right, the triangle, yeah, yeah. And then it'll also go to the can um, because you want to capture like the left side more too. Yeah, I wish there was like a patient right here. Um, what did I want to say? What were we? I forgot. Oh, just the short distance. Okay, yeah. So, um, the original pacemakers were unipolar, which is not a real term, but the, um, it would pace from the tip of the lead to the can. Mm. That's how they, the first ones came out that way. And I can still program current pacemakers that way if, say, we have like a ring fracture. If the ring stops working, or the, the thing, the short spacing, it's tip to ring. Mm -hmm. If that stops working, I can reprogram to the can. Um, the problem with unipolar pacing is the pacing vector is so large that it can stimulate the pocket. You can get pocket stems, so the pocket thumps sometimes. Not off, not all the time, but that's uh, one problem with that. And also with the large vector, you can oversense a lot of things. You can oversense valves. You can oversense blood flow, atrial signal. And then it's kind of getting off on a tangent, but Dr. Benzer said something about with your lead placement, you could actually stimulate the. Um, Nerve yes. Mm -hmm. So that's oh, most. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not here. <laughs> not here. <laughs> <laughs> Moving. <laughs> Is it? Yeah. 
<laughs> so diaphragmatic stimulation is most common with the third lead, with the left ventricular lead, because that lead wraps around the outside of the heart and that's closest to the phrenic nerve, which runs on either side. And um, if the patients get phrenic nerve stim, it's not dangerous, it's just really uncomfortable, it feels like they have the hiccups, and usually you can just change the pacing vector and it won't capture, the, which means with the four electrodes, I wouldn't pace from tip to ring, I would pace tip to, to four, tip to three or something. Or decrease the output. That's the most common problem with coronary sinus lead placement though. We test that at every implant. You'll see us tested at 10 volts, um, just to make sure that there's no phrenic capture at 10 volts. You know, we'll be probably programming the outputs around two and a half or three, so 10, if there's nothing at 10. You basically catch all of these issues when the patient is on the table. Because Ideally. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that's why it's true. Yeah. So you're just testing everything, and so you test to make sure there's no phrenic nerve, and kind of test the different voltages, mm -hmm. and then, and you also test so the main issues that potentially, like post surgery, like you said, they can fall or move things around, and then that's when mm -hmm. things might go haywire. So. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, we test each of the leads at 10 volts. Yeah. And then the tip of the leads um, have a little cushion on them. So, okay, so the way that the leads stick to the heart muscle, there's a little helix that screws out like a little pigtail. You can, active fixation, you screw them into the heart muscle. The very first ones, which still we have, are passive. And they have like little fins on them. So you stick them into the myocardium and you stick, myofibrils? What's that like the heart muscle? Papillary muscles. Yeah. yeah, you stick it past it and it'll catch on them. That's how it fixates. So is it like a uh, yeah, they're like, um, it's, it's kind of like a bunch of fins. Like a, is it kind of like a, you know, when you, like, like a screw, you know, where yeah, it, like you put them in and then it has like things sticking out that prevent it from coming back. Yeah. Kind of like those things. Yeah. Yeah, it was kind of yeah. like an anchor, you know, like yeah. that you put in for drywall. Yeah, I think it, I should find a better way of describing it. I think I have one in my purse. So, like, you hit those and then you get, like, regurgitated. Well, they can be wider. Um, like, the, you ruin the valve sometimes, right? Because the papillary muscle, gets damaged. Oh, what? Mm. You mean the cardiac muscle, not the, the papillary. Yeah, I mean cardiac muscle. Oh, so it doesn't go to, to the papillary. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, it's no, a okay. chair